And uh, the extreme for me is the one that I told you before, the, 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 the sitter conjecture. So that I think is is very weak, and I, um, I disagree, to totally disagree with it. And I think most people also disagree. But then we had a seminar every Friday that is only among students and postdocs. So a uh, con- condition to be able to give a seminar like that is to solve one Jackson problem. The guest of today's podcast is Dr. Fernando Cuevedo. He works on string theory and cosmology, and he recently published a paper that seems to give a direction to solve an old problem in string theory, which is to get a space-time in string theory with a positive cosmological constant. This space-time is also called de Sitter space-time. We will talk about his recent work in this episode. He was also the director for International Center of Theoretical Physics, or ICTP, in Italy for 10 years. In this episode, we will also talk about his experience as the director of ICTP. So, Dr. Covedo, uh, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Uh, nice to have you. So, the first question that I want to ask you is that uh, you were one of the students of Steven Weinberg. So, how did you find Weinberg as an advisor? And I think, if I'm not wrong, you recently also uh, put your you know thoughts about Weinberg on archive as well. So, it was a very nice read. But if you want to say something about Dr. Weinberg as an advisor, what would you say? Yes, very good. So, yes, as you said, just put some. They asked me this in a special issue of Nuclear Physics B. People writing about the uh, reminiscence of uh, of uh, Steven Weinberg. And uh, I was lucky enough to be his PhD student. And uh, for me, it's one of the greatest honors of my life because uh, it allowed me to interact with him uh, in a regular basis somehow. And um, if I consider him, before he died, he was clearly for me the top scientist or top physicist in the world, essentially. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, he had achieved many things. So... Uh, for me, it was, uh, uh, well, I, I come from Guatemala, and uh, so I was lucky enough that uh, I could only go to the University of Texas uh, for, for my PhD because uh, it was, there was a special program for, to attract Central American students, and uh, it happened that he came to to Austin the same uh, the year after I came. So then I had to take some courses, and after you do well in the uh, year, two year courses, then you can ask uh, to get a supervisor. And uh, to my good luck, he agreed to be my supervisor. And uh, so I was part of his group. So uh, he was always intimidating. I cannot uh, deny that because he had a strong personality, a deep voice, and an infinite amount of knowledge. So it was very difficult to. To, to discuss things that he, did, he didn't, you, you will never surprise him because he, he, he knew about everything. And, uh, but at the, at the same time, you learn a lot from him. So we had the weekly meetings, the whole group in his office, and uh, we had to discuss what uh, some of us were doing every 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 week, two or three people talking. And uh, so we got a, a little great amount of uh, um, information from him during those meetings. And then, uh, of course, he was an excellent lecturer, so we learned field theory from him and supersymmetry and so on. <clears throat> but also seeing him in action, whenever any visitor came to give seminars, as you can see, he was always asking the deepest question, the, you know, the, the, the key point of the talk. He was always capturing the most important part and, and, and mentioning to the, to the speaker. And so overall, he was... Uh, for me, an amazing opportunity to 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 interact with him, and the good thing is that I continue interacting with him over the years. So he helped me a lot uh, with ICTP and, and 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 also for me to get jobs because uh, he was uh, writing recommendation letters and so so he was always very friendly, and very 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 kind, and an extremely smart. <laughs> So uh, some months ago, uh, Cliff Burgess came on this podcast, who is also, you know, yeah. one of the students of Weinberg, and he is also one of your longtime collaborators. So yeah. he was, uh, you know, describing, you know, the ethos of the Weinberg theory group in the 80s. Uh, I mean, that included Weinberg, but it also, it also included some someone like Jojo Likin and Ken Candelas and people like that. So mm-hmm. what was your experience of working in that particular group in the 80s? Yeah, that, that was wonderful. Yes. yes, I'm glad you mentioned Joe Likin, because Joe... Joe was a postdoc on Weinberg when I was starting, and I was lucky that uh, uh, Weinberg asked Joe to help me with my, which had to do the undergraduate, uh, sorry, the before thesis that's called the qualifying exam. 
And then I, I did most of the work with uh, Joe. And since Joe was working with the uh, Weinberg, so then, then, then uh, it helped me a lot to, to, to do the, the right things. And, but then, as you said, uh, since Weinberg arrived, he uh, his position implied that he could attract other people to, to work. So there were several visitors, like um, Paul Townsend, for instance, who was my, my colleague here in Cambridge. He was one of the visitors, and then I worked with Paul also, uh, at that time, Supergravity. Um, then uh, Mike Dolph and Chris Pope, who uh, who were the experts on 11-dimensional uh, Supergravity, which was, at that time, the, 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 the hottest thing before String Theory came out. And, and young people like Philip Candelas, Claudio Teitelboim, Bryce DeWitt, John Wheeler, you have heard about the Wheeler DeWitt equation, for instance, the two pioneers of quantum gravity were both senior professors in, in, in Austin. And then young people came, uh, Willie Fischler, especially Joe Polchinski, who was uh, one of my heroes. He was uh, an outstanding uh, professor for us, and, 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 and we learned a lot from him. So all the meetings, the, the, we had all the opinion of these the different people, which were very, 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 very active and interesting. So, so we felt that we were in, like in one of the top places in the world because of this combination of, of people. You know, uh, George Sudarshan was also a very famous uh, high energy physicist. He was there. Yuval Neiman was involved with the, with the Eightfold Way that gave rise to quarks was also there. So it was an impressive group of people, and uh, and uh, so we learned a lot from them. And of, of course. The postdocs and graduate students, so in particular, and for me, Cliff Burgess was a, was a key source of information because uh, uh, whatever I didn't understand, I knew I could like, go and ask Cliff, and Cliff would explain it to me. So that was uh, also very good. So this uh, and m many other uh, graduate students. So it was a very very good experience to be there. So he also mentioned the uh, difference in styles of doing physics. For example, he quoted this example that Weinberg used to think in very general terms and someone like Polchinski used to think of a very specific example to do a particular kind of physics. So did you also find this kind of difference of doing physics in, you know, in the Weinberg theory group? Absolutely, yes. Um, yeah, that, that was a good example of comparing Weinberg. Just because, although there are many, many similarities between the two of them. They, they were always very deep thinkers. That's uh, something. And they were always like, going to ask for the, 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 the deepest question. And uh, on the other hand, we had uh, Philip Candelas, for instance, who, who at that time made a breakthrough with this uh, Calabi-Java compactifications. And it was very mathematical. And so in that sense, we saw the different approaches. And it was interesting to see from the string theory point of view that the most mathematical person, uh, Philip, was doing what is called a string phenomenology, <laughs> because that's Calabi-Ya will give you something like the standard model, whereas the real phenomenologists or high energy physicists like Van Beren Polchinski were doing deep questions within string theory. So that that, that gives you the uh, uh, an idea of the, how broad the group was, but also you can look for your own speciality. And it happens to be that the, at that time, you were very mathematical, you will, appro you will be approaching um, phenomenological questions <laughs> that, that, that Whereas you were deep, you wanted to understand the string theory by, by what it was. And then, so without asking the phenomenological questions. So in that sense, I put Weinberg and Polchinski closer to each other compared to Philip Candelas or compared to Claudio Teitelbein. Um, that they were probably very formal persons, more into the uh, mind of, you know, they were, at that time, you can separate people by uh, high energy physicists and, and general relativity people. So, so Weinberg was a typical high energy physicist, and uh, Polchinski was, and general relativity was uh, Wheeler, DeWitt, and then Title One, and in that group, uh, Philip Candelas also went through. So that that was, that was a different way of thinking because uh, the general relativity people were just thinking about well, gravity and uh, Einstein's uh, theory, how to make it. Uh, Consistent with quantum gravity, with uh, quantum theory, and uh, and the particle physicists were just asking particle physics questions about the unification and and so on. Uh, but in the eighties, the the two merged because the high energy physicists had solved already everything. You had the standard model, and then the only thing remaining was the gravity. So then then you had the approach to quantum gravity from a particle physicist and approach to quantum gravity from a general relativity person. And they were not uh, the same because one is more geometrical, the other one is more field theory. And uh, so it was good to have both 
both kind of schools represented in in in, in Austin. I see. So the timing of this podcast is very good because recently you published this paper with, uh, you know, Cliff Burgess, which seems to solve, not solve, but head into the direction of solving a very big problem in string theory, which is getting four dimensional distributor compactifications. So I want to talk about, you know, the results of that paper. But before we talk about that result, uh, can you briefly describe for the audience, what is the distributor problem in string theory? Very good. Yes, well, it... Well, string theory is not fully understood yet. It's only a collection of of of, uh, of ideas, uh, mostly based on perturbative uh, issues in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a theory. So, without having proper non-perturbative formulation of the theory, and so still we don't know what the string theory is. If we want to be critical enough, um, <clears throat> but we know it limits the the weak coupling. Or uh, large volumes, so then, then in those limits, we can do calculations that we can trust. So that's that's essentially the, the limitation of the string theory itself. Uh, and so it's easier to do calculations. So you have a flat space time, like a Minkowski. So and, and that you can have your your perturbation theory well defined. You can have a bit of the leading order term, then the next order term, and so on. And uh, if you are a weak coupling, you can you 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 could you trust your calculations because then higher order terms will be uh, smaller and smaller. <clears throat> now, um, now came the experimental fact that uh, in the nineteen nineties, people discovered that essentially the universe is accelerating, and the simplest explanation is that you have a non-zero vacuum energy. And so you have a non-zero vacuum energy. That means you, you combine that with gravity. That means that you have a, a space which is the sitter space or approximately the sitter, meaning that you have a cosmological constant, which is different from zero. That's the, that's the, and it's positive, positive different from zero and extremely small. And that makes the, the what I call the, the greatest puzzle in physics. You know, the, the, the greatest problem is to understand quantum gravity or gravity at the quantum level. But the greatest puzzle is one number that people have been observed, which is the acceleration of the universe. And the puzzle is to, to find an explanation why we, we, we can describe it from a fundamental theory, uh, this period of accelerated expansion. And, uh, and this non-zero cosmological constant is the simplest possibility. And there are alternatives which are just slowly varying cosmological constant, but also uh, um, uh, at positive values. And so for string theory, which is a theory of gravity, that's a challenge. You have to explain that aspect of, of, of nature. And uh, it's an observation, and the string theory has always had the uh, problem that is is, is uh, that every single theory, any theory that tries to solve the quantum gravity uh, problem is that uh, it has to be a, a theory that is valid at energies which are extremely high. And uh, in terms of uh, of numbers, you, we know that it's, let's say, uh, it's, it's a scale called the Planck scale. And um, to give you an idea, the Planck scale is uh, 10 to the 19 GeV, and uh, 1 GeV is the mass of the proton. And the highest energies we can reach in the experiments is the ones that the LHC has CERN, which is, uh, um, you know, the order of, of uh, TVs, which is uh, 1,000 or so GeV, mass of the protons. So in that sense, um, we are afraid that um, the, the energies needed to test any theory of, of quantum gravity are so large that we don't have any experimental uh, even idea how to eventually do it. So you will need an accelerator of the size of the galaxy or something. And uh, and so so and that's a problem with any theory of, that pretends to solve the quantum gravity problem. And string theory is one of those. But then there is this golden opportunity. You can say you have a fundamental theory. Maybe you, if you can explain this observable feature of the universe, which is the accelerating universe, then uh, uh, that would be a big uh, success for the theory to explain that. And um, 20, a bit more than 20 years ago, uh, people came with concrete um, scenarios for a string theory to achieve that. <clears throat> that was mostly the work of um, Polchinski in particular, uh, uh, together with the Cashew in Stanford, and then 
then there was a cash through Carlos Linde and Trivedi, Carlos and Linde from Stanford and, and Trivedi from, from India, and uh, f from the Tata Institute, I think. And uh, <clears throat> so th they came up with that proposal, which is one specific uh, scenario within string theory, that at the end, you, do, you can do calculations in the regime that you can trust, this is perturbative expansion, as I told you, and uh, um, that allows you to have uh, uh, the Sitter space. So the solution, which is the vacuum energy, is uh, is positive. And uh, so that was a big success at that time, but everybody recognized that it was uh, based on approximations. That you have to make sure you can trust them or not. And uh, on that, there was an issue. Um, there were two issues. Uh, one is called um, the Dine Cyber problem that was realized in the 1980s. Uh, Dine and Cyber realized that uh, that uh, essentially the the that any if anything comes from from string theory, you will have <clears throat> like a, a scalar potential for any scalar field coming from the theory, like the size of the extra dimensions or so or even the string coupling, it will always go uh, run away towards infinity. And you, you have the, the, pot the potential energy against the value of the field, and, and it will always go to, to infinity, and, and the value of the potential will be zero. But the, that zero will be the theory in 10 dimensions, or so the theory at zero coupling, which is not where we live. <laughs> so what, what we'll, if we want to describe our world, it has to be in four dimensions, and it has to be uh, relatively uh, weak coupling, but not zero coupling. <clears throat> like the couplings of uh, any particles to each other, the quarks to the leptons and to the photon and so on. So, um, so that was a problem. So if there was a runaway, we need, but we needed as a potential with a minimum at some point, which was positive uh, energy. And then you can have the runaway, but if you have the minimum, then the argument of Daniel Sauer is that if you find a minimum, you are in the regime that you cannot trust your calculations. Your your expansion parameter is is is, uh, is is not that small. So that means the second next order will be probably competing with the previous order and so on. So you cannot trust the calculations. And in the case of uh, KKLT, this uh, 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 as people I told you that that had achieved that in, in twenty years ago. Um, you included that kind of that kind of expansions, and you have to make sure. And we have been spending the last twenty years, several people trying to understand um, uh, if if these expansions are trustable. And uh, <clears throat> there has been, and that is also um, combined with uh, something else that is a, what people call a no go theorem, and it very often comes under the name of Maldazena Nunez, but it was known before by Gary Gibbons and 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 and, uh, and the Wheat and others, and uh, <clears throat> that you just look for the classical equations of string theory or, or supergravity at that time. Um, then the generic case is that uh, you don't have solutions that uh, that give you positive vacuum energy. So you you put your equations using say answers equations that. Uh, in, 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 in the in the linear order approximation or classical order, and then um, then you can prove that uh, a quantity if you have a, a positive cosmological constant or a positive vacuum energy, a quantity that should be positive in your equations happened to be negative. So it was a contradiction. So that's what's called a no go theorem. And uh, uh, people that say KKT, everybody knew, knew about this uh, no go theorems, but they were only classical. And the elements that KKLT had done include a lot of quantum effects. So in that sense, that no go theorem was over. I mean, it was not relevant. And and uh, and the and the dying cyber problem that was you can find a minimum in a regime that you can trust because you have new parameters. And the new parameters are very interesting because there are a huge number of integers called fluxes, like magnetic fluxes, and they have to be uh, quantized, like uh, people do in Jerusalem. In 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 uh, in field theory, maybe you know, like the the right quantization condition in in for monopoles. If you, if, for people who have heard about that, um, so and the fluxes have to be quantized, and the, these numbers are integers, but the integers can be many values, and you have ten to thousand solutions. So so, so you have so many solutions that uh, that play a role. That I'll, those numbers you you can play with them and and, and get a minimum in in the regime that you can trust your calculations. So that that was the the positive part. And that, 
so it's not only sort of the possibility of getting the sitter, which is a big thing, but it also gave you an explanation why the cosmological constant that we observe or the acceleration that we observe is so small and that people thought it was zero until in the 1990s. Um, because since you have so many solutions, one of them at least can describe the, the number that we observe. And that is what people call the cosmological constant problem. And that was a real puzzle. And uh, as I remember when we were young with the, with Cliff and, 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 and others, we, always our dream was to say eventually solve the cosmological constant problem. And at that time, the cosmological constant was considered to be zero. So we wanted to find arguments why it was zero. And then the experiments tell you, no, no, it's not zero, but it's extremely small. So the puzzle is even worse because you have to explain that it's almost zero, but not zero. And to give you numbers is for the order of 10 to the minus 120 in, in, in natural units. So it's a huge I mean, number of zeros uh, but that, that, that you have to, to explain. And having these solutions allowed you that. So I think uh, that was, a, I consider that a big progress, a big success, but since we since we are addressing, I, I work a lot on that with my colleagues, my, my students, and so on. And we made modifications of that approach. Uh, some we put something called the large volume scenario, where that achieves the same things and, and, and with the, with some advantages. And uh, uh, but we have uh, people say that you you make um, uh, what was called that. Um, uh, big claims need big evidence. <laughs> so that means you have solved that problem, you need to provide uh, as much evidence as possible. So many of us have been trying to see if there are the, computing the next order corrections to see if they affect those results or if there are anything that can go wrong in different directions. And, and this is very complicated because we don't understand, as I told you before, the string theory fully to, to, to do all those calculations. And, uh, and so it has been challenging. And uh, but progress has been made and Many of the of the complaints that could the thing that could go wrong had been proven to be uh, correct. So the complaint was not correct. So that I mean that, that this has survived. In particular, Polchinski, in particular, before he died, uh, unfortunately he died very young. Uh, before he died, he was uh, killing one of the arguments against uh, KKLT, which I, th I think is it was very, very very convincing. So in that sense, this has survived over the years. But in the last few years. There's something that people have revived this because you say, well, there is always this classical issue about the number theorems. This all needs, all thing needs a lot of approximations, and so people say, what about if there's some some kind of conspiracy that forbids you that eventually, to, in a fully controlled calculation, you may not get uh, the sitter to work, and um, then it became more. Um, Remarkable somehow at some point that people made it into a correct a conjecture, and it's called the Swanland conjecture, and um, that says the sitter may not be a solution, and that has forced some of us to be more explicit on, on our calculations, or to look for different ways of of uh, of finding the sitter, and this paper you referred to that I did with Cliff and, uh, a couple of weeks ago, it goes into that direction because. Of, Contrary to the KKLT, we're doing everything is classical, and yet we avoid the novel theorems, and then we address also this dying server problem. So I think it's a, it's a step in that direction, but I would not consider the first solution of something, because I'm, I was already convinced that the, the, the whole thing in the past are, are okay. It's only that we, we are, as I told you, we need to provide further and further evidence, and this will be for me a very strong uh, evidence that this, is, this, this, this works. And, um, but as usual in physics, you, you you achieve something, but there are all, all the, some questions being open. We have to identify the singularities that we get there, and so on. So there are always open questions. But um, um, but I think it, it's progress in the right direction. Right. So uh, the kind of compactifications that you have considered in your paper. Correct me if I'm wrong. So if you try to find a stringy origin of those compactifications, they come from F theory. And you compactify them on a six-dimensional, sorry, a club EO three folds, which are six-dimensional, and mm -hmm. then uh, you compactify them again to four dimensions. And in, and if I'm not wrong, then these compactifications are not maximally symmetric in six dimensions, but mm -hmm. they are maximally symmetric in four dimensions. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be an, an interesting solution. But why do you think that this solution took quite a long time to be found? <laughs> yes. Well, there is, I think it's an interesting story there. Um, then I can go back 
1984. In 1984, people were doing higher dimensional theories, like Caruza Klein theories, and with supersymmetry, and there was supergravity. And there was a big problem in that sense that, that the, the favorite theories, like 11 dimensional supergravity, were very nice and like, uh, you know, the, the highest number of supersymmetries you can have and the, the highest uh, dimension. And, and, but they were not chiral theories. I mean, that means that we cannot explain the standard model because the standard model did make a difference between left and right. So it's, it's chiral. And that's how string theory became prominent because string theory was a theory like that, but it was chiral, expanding from 10 dimensions, so you get something chiral. And, uh, and then, then Candelas and collaborators, that they found the solution, which are Calabellado, and then you get a solution, at, uh, at, uh, a classical solution, which has a property that is, even though you have the 10 dimensional theory is, is a solution, you have another solution, which is four dimension, and with the zero cosmological constant in, in four dimensions, classically, and, and a chiral theory. So in that sense, that, that was a, a big progress. But six months before that paper, <laughs> There was this paper of of uh, of uh, uh, Salam and Sesgin that they started with a theory which was a six dimensional theory. It was uh, less ambitious somehow, only six dimensions, but with the advantage that you can go from six to four. You can have a two sphere, but everybody knows about the two sphere. You can do the calculations because everything is uh, symmetric, and then they got the same thing that people got in Calabria six months before. <laughs> you have four dimensions. Minkowski space flat theory with a chiral theory, and with an extra advantage is that you you started with a potential like dying Sabre claim, and that the energy provided by that potential was compensated by fluxes uh, of a magnetic fluxes that, that were competing with that and allowed you to have the the the, the solution. So the, it will tell you, well, this runaway behavior means that there are no solutions in six dimensions. Which is okay because we didn't we don't live in six dimensions. But once you turn fluxes on on magnetic fluxes, which are precisely two dimensional, uh, you can wrap around the say that the sphere on that. Then you have uh, four dimensional maximal symmetry solutions. So it's it's like more or less you were forced to compactify. Which is always people say, oh, why do we why do they have the extra dimensions too small compared to the original ones? And in this case, it was. The original six dimensional theory, they, they, had, they had no solutions, uh, uh, maximum symmetric, and, and then forced you to, to find solutions which were uh, uh, less dimensional, and four dimensional was the natural one. So it's, I think it's, it was even nicer. The criticism that you could do to this Salam Seskin theory is, uh, is that why six dimensions? Because there is no fundamental theory in six dimensions, it's just a supergravity. And then you have to derive it from 10 dimensional string theory or so. And uh, we revived that for other reasons uh, later on, but there was this challenge of how to derive that theory from string theory. And um, there was there was one paper of um, uh, Gary Gibbons and Chris Pope and Miriam Svetish, I think, and that they achieved that, but in a way that the extra dimensions were non-compact, so they were hyperbolic. So it was not good to describe uh, the four-dimensional world we live. So. And, and and that was, uh, I don't remember, uh, maybe 18 years ago or so. But then 10 years ago, there was a paper by Thomas Green and collaborators. There were two papers and uh, where they this, they managed to describe this six-dimensional theory from F-theory, which is a, a version of, of uh, one of the string theories at, at strong coupling. And uh, that paper, for some reason, was overlooked. Uh, we who were working in six dimensions had left, uh, had stopped thinking about six dimensions for a while, uh, and then when the paper came, I, I didn't pay, I didn't realize it came, and then uh, the people who wrote the paper were not very much interested in following up the 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 the, the, the city or or, or yeah, more realistic uh, solutions. So essentially, people didn't follow up. And only last year, when I was visiting Cliff at the Perimeter Institute, we started talking, well, it would be nice to have these solutions. And then it so happened, as uh, very often happened with Cliff, he had found not only the, the solutions that Salam and Sesgin had, but also uh, he, he and, and, and collaborators in 2005, they had found all well, this theory, solutions were, were the city, the Salam and Sesgin were, had found them, had found only Minkowski, to me, flat. 
for dementia. So what Cliff had found solutions which were the sitting and anti you know, positive and negative cosmological constant, um, but um, numerically. So you can. So it was a big uh, bit of a challenge uh, numerical to find the solutions, but but they were there. So so uh, and then what we did now is to combine the two things to combine the the, the derivation of. Uh, of uh, the sixth dimension from from string theory, say from F theory, and then using the techniques that Cliff had used in the past for for getting the C three and sixth dimension. So then then we we also we apply to to these equations, which were a bit more complicated, but it, I, again numerically you can you can find solutions. I see. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the salam sazgin solution that you're talking about, that solution was super symmetric, but yes. these later solutions are not super symmetric, right? Absolutely. So yes. so. Uh, doesn't that give you a disadvantage that you will not have that much calculational control over these solutions? Uh, yes, um, yes, uh, it's, it's easier if it's super symmetric. But for this, uh, I can. Uh, there is a quote that I I, I I can copy to from Eva Silverstein from Stanford. Mm -hmm. She said that you know it's good to have super symmetry to do calculations, but there are theories that we know are not super symmetric, and still you can trust the calculations. And a, a typical example is all physics. <laughs> all of physics we have been doing that because <laughs> yeah. physics there is no supersymmetry in nature so far. So, so in that sense, supersymmetry is a help, but I mean it's not a requirement. So essentially, everything that people have done in, since Newton to now, all the calculations that we can trust and test experimentally, they have been done in, in a domain that you can you can control your calculations and you didn't need supersymmetry. So in this sense, supersymmetry, uh, you know, it's, it's it's easier to have supersymmetric theory because you can, it's, it's more restrictive, but it's not a requirement. Right. Okay. So uh, in in the compactifications that you are working with, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So to come from six dimensions to four dimensions, you compactify on this space that looks like a rugby ball. And just like a rugby ball, you have these conical singularities on, you know, the ends. And mm -hmm. uh, if I'm if I'm not wrong, I think in the in your paper you say that that's probably an indication that you have these source brains here. And mm -hmm. there are some fields that become, you know, divergent on these points. Mm -hmm. So uh, and, and you use this uh, thing called uh, so this this is uh, something that I'm not familiar with. Uh, this is called point particle effective field theory that I'm not familiar with. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what what I want to ask is that do these points you know uh, make a serious difficulty in your work or do you think that this is not that big of a problem? I think you give give this example in your paper about the nucleus that okay you can you know calculate the energy levels of the nucleus although the Coulomb potential diverges mm -hmm. at the center. Uh, so okay so is it like that I, you know or I, I, is it more it's, complicated? Yes. No, it's, 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 it's true what you say. Yeah, so you know effective theory is the you know what the best tool we we had we have had and, and we the way we understand nature is through effective theory because that helps us understand nature by different scales. So and uh, so in that sense, um, it, it is the, the 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 way that we we, we can do calculations and, and and control them. And um, but of course in string theory, you know effective theory means that at some point your 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 theory breaks down and you have to go to the ultraviolet complete theory and the string theory should be that one. But for questions like this, effective theory should be enough. And it's like uh, you say, well, I want to see what happened in the bulk, and they have these two singularities, as you said, like the rugby ball. And uh, and so we follow essentially uh, the old trick of having this. Uh, um, pillboxes, like a Gauss's pillbox, you surround the singularity with a pillbox, and then you don't know what happened to the singularity, but you can put the, the, the boundary conditions on the, on, the, on, the, on the boundary of the pillbox, and then get information about the singularity. And that people have done, for instance, uh, you know, for, as you say, for, for in atomic physics, um, Cliff had done also with this, with some other collaborators, uh, uh, even to compute the, 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 how the presence of the nucleus Changes the energy levels of the atoms of the nuclear the electron in the atoms. So you can you can have uh, you can see the implications like a back reaction of this object to to, to your geometry. And uh, so instead of a point which was the nucleus, we have a, a brains now because we have a it's a standard object. So it's, it's a singularity in the in the in the in the, in the six dimensions in the two dimensions six and two extra dimensions of the six. But then they go for our, all of our three dimensional spaces. So that's a, a, it will be like a like a people will call a three brain. Um, <clears throat> so uh, and 
Well, then the question is, is, since you were deriving it from a string theory, you would like to know more details about these three brains. And uh, so that's something we, we are working on it, just to see. Uh, uh, for instance, the simplest example we were showing, these three brains, we managed to compute the tension of the brains, which is, is good. It's like the mass, computing the mass of the other. And if it is negative, it may be problematic, but if it is positive, it is okay. So we found it to be positive. We also found that the solution was that, that, that these two extra dimensions were bigger than the other four. So in that sense, we can trust the, the, the approximation that we can just go from 10 to 6 and then from 6 to 4 and um, and so on. So we can have interact uh, tests. Um, but since the solutions we des we described were the simplest we could find, um, so that the, in <clears throat> we can... Um, See the the cop the we can just assign a charge to these brains, and usually the, if there are the Porchinsky introduced the D D three brains, if it's the D brain, you will have a, a D brain charge. So in this case, the, since our solution were the simplest, we the, the D brain charge was zero, <laughs> and the same thing. Um, uh, yes, first answer that that, that that was, and uh, uh, and the, if you have D seven also, the D seven charge was zero. So. Ideally, we would like to, to have cases where the D3 brain charge is non-zero, so you can have real D3 brains there. And so this looks like a, maybe a composite object that con con combines D brains with uh, orientable planes or something to make it a uh, zero charge. And uh, But again, not knowing the details here is like, like you know, you want to go to the st full strong coupling of the quarks to understand what happened in, in, in in the atoms, uh, so it would be good, but uh, but, I mean, but uh, uh, as a as a proof of existence that there are solutions, I think we think is 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 we have it is good enough, but of course we are always ambitious. We want to understand things better, and so we like to understand the the nature of these uh, singularities. I see. So in February or probably in March, there were these observational results that were quite popular in in the physics community. And those results were coming from DAISY. And they, you know, observed that dark energy is a cosmological constant. If, if there is a cosmological constant, then it's changing. So do you think that this particular observation has some direct consequences for the studies of Decider in string theory? Or do you think that that's far removed from uh, no, I, I think it's interesting. As, uh, as I said, the city is the simplest explanation, um, uh, but a slowly varying uh, scalar field that was called quintessence that could could also uh, uh, work and it could be accommodated into string theory. It's usually more complicated. So there's a wrong belief that this that I've heard several people claiming in the past that is, is wrong, is that this all is very generic in string theory to have this runaway behavior. And then you saw a violent scalar field that has that. But that's not quintessence. You, you, know, you have to, to be a runaway. So runaway is different from quintessence. Runaway, you can, you, can, you can run, but very fast, and you will never accelerate the universe. So to have quintessence, you have to have a runaway, which is almost, almost flat. And so the challenge, the, the mathematical challenge, to get quintessence are equally difficult or more than to get just the sitter. So and that's because to get quintessence, you have to fix all the, the value of all the scalar fields that you have, what we call moduli fields, to, to one value with positive uh, energy, and let only one of them to change and roll very, 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 very slowly and, and very uh, shallow uh, potential. And that's very challenging to get. Uh, but it could be, I mean, nature has already shown us that, uh, you know, it was easier to have a zero cosmological constant and the, the nature tells us, no, it's not zero. So this contestant may, may be also there. It's an extra complication, uh, but uh, but uh, you can achieve it, but it's more difficult. So that that, that, that is, uh, uh, so it would be a challenge. Now, the DC results are interesting, but they're not conclusive. And so the, we are waiting for the next round of, 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 uh, of uh, observations in the next uh, few months or in the next year. And then if they are confirmed, so then uh, then that will be very interesting. So, but at the moment, I think we have to keep an open mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you feel about anthropic reasonings for dark energy <laughs> or the value of dark yes. energy? I, I think, well, that's precisely the, 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 the point where I was going. Uh, about this 10 to the thousand solutions and so on. 
and uh, that addresses the cosmological constant uh, problem. And I like to say this follow, I mean, very controversial statement that uh, uh, for do, doing that, and then you say, oh, you have 10 to the thousand solutions, one of them may have the vacuum energy that, or, or the acceleration that we observe, and then we leave there. And then why do we leave there and not others? It's because of anthropic reasons that you can have galaxies and, and us, you, you have that value, you cannot have it if it is much bigger or much smaller. Because the universe would accelerate too fast, or and or or, or contract, and we would never have galaxies. So in that sense, that that's, that requires an anthropic explanation. When it came, I think it was very much of a debate, and people love it or hate it. That's one of those things. Uh, um, you know, living in the UK, is something you know, this marmite that, that this is something that people eat here. That some people really love it or really hate it. So in that sense, more or less, is with with the with the. Uh, with this solution of the cosmic constant problem, you call that string landscape with many solutions, and one of the solutions give us us. And uh, um, I like to call it the the worst solution of the of the cosmological constant problem or the dark energy problem, with the exceptions of all the other ones. <laughs> so that means that uh, this is the only solution we have. So so whether we like it or not, whoever tells you they have a solution to the cosmic constant problem, uh, I'm sure it will be. Uh, Proven wrong in uh, very fast. So I said, you know, the cosmological constant problem is, is very, 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 very. It's a very difficult problem, and and using all the techniques that we know, especially effective theories and so on, that that, that those, those are the ways that we understand nature. Uh, the question is not to, not, not to explain that this number value takes this value. The question is that we know that there are contributions already from the standard model, from the electron itself, from the Higgs particle that we have observed, that they make big contributions to, to this vacuum energy. So you have to explain why this all these contributions are are, are killed somehow, or, or and get to get this very small number, and uh, and so for that you need to take care of all these quantum corrections. The anthropic argument with all these different solutions takes care of those of, of the solutions because there are so many solutions. So whatever you contribution you have, you always have a, another uh, solution of, of, of the landscape that satisfies you. you that a, any other approach to the cosmic constant problem or the dark energy problem essentially obviates this part, and that part has been the main problem. That has been the problem of the cosmic constant. Uh, that, that why these quantum corrections are not uh, uh, contributing or they or they contribute in such a small manner. So, so in that sense, um, either we like it or not, this is the, the, the best solution. You can then take a positive point of view as well. We have a string theory. People say that the, there's no relationship with experiments. There's a, this experiment and we have, this is the only explanation and the explanation comes naturally in a string theory because you have all the solutions. Uh, Weinberg used to say that, uh, that uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, we as scientists, we like to have uh, real explanations of, of of things, and the anthropic arguments are uh, against that attitude because then you cannot explain every single everything single thing in nature. So, uh, and so we 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 are not satisfied with the anthropic explanation. So that's why, for instance, me and Cliff and many others, we always try to find alternatives to this anthropic explanation. But he always remarks, as, as a wise person, he says. But why may why should nature care about the taste of physicists? <laughs> so, so nature may be like that, and that's it. So either we like it, or it doesn't matter if we like it or not. So we have to try to explain. And uh, at the moment, there's no better explanation. And um, I see. Yes, and I don't, and I don't think I'm, I'm not giving up. I would like to have a, a better explanation. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but uh, but at the moment, I, I cannot do better, and I don't think anybody can do better. So. Uh, I I don't know if there any uh, there is any other example of this, but um, but I, I think the only uh, only time when someone someone actually used anthropic arguments to you know predict a number was Weinberg in the late eighties. So do you think that that particular thing will ever be repeated? That somebody uses anthropic argument to you know produce a number? Uh, well, why not? Yes, yeah, people start playing that game. It it is dangerous. Um, when I give my talks, I I put it as the the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> you know, the good is that we explain this very fundamental problem in, in science. We have an explanation. That's good. The bad is that is that it prevents us to find new physics at that scale, which will have been perfect. We'll be looking for uh, physics at at a micrometer scale, and that we can have experiments and so on. 
and so that's bad because, because it doesn't it doesn't give us any new new, new new physics because the, because the scale is just given by by the anthropic. And the ugly is that you can start using anthropic arguments for for any any problem you want. <laughs> you have to explain, uh, you know, the mass of the the difference of masses of the part of the quarks and so on. I'll just put anthropic uh, the, this kind of things. And and that I think that then. Um, it will be against again this uh, natural thing of scientists to to try to explain things, and uh, so anthropic may be an easy way out. So, but I think there are all these these uh, numbers that are very very uh, curious to explain. Right? It's, it's, you know, the up quark will be a little bit uh, uh, heavier than the down quark, or the other way around. The physics is totally different. So, so is that can that be an anthropic argument or not? Or and uh, yeah, so it's it's, a, it's very puzzling, but we, so the, essentially the, the point is that we should be able to explain as much as possible without using anthropic arguments. And uh, and in this case, the cosmological constant happens to be the one that we haven't been able to avoid. And maybe at some point we, we will come out with a better answer, but for that one, we don't have a better explanation. And it's making it more complicated because of the hierarchy problem. Sorry, uh, because there is the hierarchy problem, which is um, that we thought that we had a, the a very compelling solution, which was uh, supersymmetry. And uh, the fact that they haven't discovered supersymmetry, supersymmetry makes us uh, stand out that there is also a natural, a naturalness problem about the mass of the Higgs already. So whatever happens, it will be probably an order or two of magnitude. But uh, that's already um, uh, an indication that that may also that could that could also be anthropic, and there are uh, proposals for that. Uh, I'm not convinced of that. I hope the supersymmetry may be discovered, <laughs> and then uh, you know once we go to the next collider, so but uh, we'll see. Okay, so you you have also worked on this scenario that is uh, you know uh, I don't know if he introduced it, but I think he is one of the uh, you know people who are working on this stuff. So Kumbun Bafa works on this scenario called the dark dimension scenario. And you have also done some work on it. So can you describe briefly for the audience what is this scenario and what are your thoughts about this scenario? Yes, I may not be the right person to ask because I'm not very uh, enthusiastic about it. Uh, it is, for me, it's like reviving some ideas in the late 1990s when people like uh, Kani Hamed, Demopoulos and Valley they came with this idea, oh, there may be uh, extra dimensions, but the extra dimensions can be very large right, for, for our standards. So large mean, means a, a fraction of a millimeter or so. And then, then with that, that will be an alternative, for instance, to supersymmetry to explain the, the hierarchy problem, for instance, if you manage to stabilize them. And so, and then that allows you a lot of numerology. That's one of the reasons, actually, we started working in six dimensions, because in, in six dimensions, things Fit the scales fit very nicely. The the, the cosmological constant scale fits nicely with the with the scale of of um, of 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 of, uh, of, 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 of the mass of the Higgs, and uh, so you can play. So it was a lot of numerology with people used, but not real calculations behind to to support whatever you were doing. So, so in that sense, so there are, you know going back to even earlier to the Iraq, people were doing that in the past, just had a lot of big numbers, take ratios of things like that, of things like the mass of the proton, the mass of the electron and so on, and get that, all these big numbers and try to find some connection between all of them. And uh, so that, that didn't bring us that far 25 years ago uh, after the, the uh, uh, large extra dimensions uh, scenario was proposed. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's the same now, so this is small variation. Um, so what Kunrun and Colorados came up with is that uh, they have been doing something which I find interesting. Uh, is this is called the Swamland program. And the, uh, essentially, the idea is that, uh, as I told you, there's the landscape, which is a huge number of solutions that we have. But they claim there are many more solutions. There are many more theories that cannot be promoted to, towards uh, as a solutions of an ultraviolet complete theory. And so, and that's they call the Swamland. So theories that look perfectly okay as an effective field theory as low energies, but they cannot be promoted to 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 a full uh, fully fledged theory at the, in the UV. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, and that I think is is good because that will tell you if it were not true, 
if every single effective material is okay, then it doesn't matter what is your UV theory, you can always have so many effective materials. And so in that sense, that's a way of cleaning up and giving right the opportunity for something derived from a string theory or any other theory of quantum gravity to, to have an implication uh, at, at low energies because you can uh, filter somehow theories which you cannot uh, uplift the quantum gravity. So in overall, the scenario, I, I am sympathetic, and, and that's it's just, it's in the back of our mind for many years, we'll essentially, with a different branding, you know, it's called Swamland. Before, we we're just looking for modern independent results. So what is it that we can predict from a string theory that is totally modern independent? And and uh, I can probably later on, I can give you uh, examples that, that, that I, I, I have, but, but uh, if, to not deviate from the Swamland picture, so, so they came out with several... Uh, proposals. Some of them are are very solid, and I think they are correct. It's almost you can call the conjectural, but they are more or less agreed in the community that they, that they're okay. One of them is this: uh, the gravity is the is the weakest force. So people have come out with different arguments using string theory and different all other the models, and at the end, everything seems to fit with the fact that gravity is is weaker than any other forces. So that I think is nice. It's a very concrete statement. It's difficult to put to to make that into something that can be tested experimentally, but uh, but in principle, it's, it's good to know as a general result from from quantum gravity. Um, the other one, uh, which I, I I have worked on the past also, which I think is is, is also very good, is uh, the absence of global symmetries in a uh, the theory of quantum gravity, in particular in string theory, there are no global symmetries. So all the theory, if there is a symmetry, it has to be local, like a gauge symmetry, like a, the one from electromagnetism. And uh, and that, that I think is also very, very much accepted. We will think that the evidence, there's almost a proof by Banks and Dixon in the 80s, which was a, a very beautiful argument using conformal field theories, um, that uh, you, you have you have a theory, a symmetry, a global symmetry. It so happens that in the spectrum, that theory implies that you have to have the corresponding gauge field for that symmetry. So that would be that symmetry is actually local and not global. So that 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 uh, I think, and and then people have been uh, uh, tuning that argument or generalizing that argument. So I think that that again is is called a global symmetry conjecture, but it's, I think it's very much said that. But then there are other conjectures that are less less uh, uh, solid, I would say. And uh, the extreme for me is the one that I told you before, the, 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 the Sitter conjecture. So that I think is is very weak, and I, I disagree, to that I disagree with it. And I think most people also disagree. And uh, uh, and the arguments are not are not uh, compelling at all. They're just, uh, just uh, putting uh, several other things together, but not very, very compelling. I think now they have modified the conjecture to say, well, there's no the conjecture in the asymptotics, which is precisely the nine of the problem that I told you they you know, run away. So in that sense, that will not that is not surprising. Now, in that sense, I think they're making progress in that because this this is runaway I told you, they are describing it in more detail, which is good. They tell you this an exponential decay, they they give you the, the the power of the exponentials and so on. So so in that sense that the, the you you get a, a bit more of information. And then the, the and there's something like, like the distance conjecture that you can go beyond the distance uh, bigger than the Planck scale. So, so essentially, Kumrum and collaborators combined several of these things, and and then came out with a proposal, which uh, single out five dimensions, and uh, uh, and then that means that the extra dimension had to be uh, compact, but it has, uh, is uh, uh, relatively big, but similar to the. To the 1990s, the the the, the um, I can't have the Maplesum Valley, and uh, and then you can test it by deviations of gravity at the micrometers that people have been trying to over the years. Also, so in that sense, it's, it's like re reviving that uh, story of the uh, uh, 25 years ago. Um, now now justified by 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 some putting together several conjectures. Um, one one argument I have against that is that. This uh, my my former collaborator Lucy Banyas, who has been working on, on this in in Madrid with other people, and they come out using um, this uh, uh, Sunland conjectures, another combination of Sunland conjectures. They come up with a totally different scenario with different scales, with different size, and so on. So it looks like this five dimensions is far from unique in that sense. 
But so that's that's the critical side. Uh, what I like about, uh, you know, I, I like Kurm Room very much. He's driving the field. He's a very very it's a force of nature, and I think that's that's always positive. And uh, but also, they have been using the, all these conjectures in the past just to criticize previous models that people have tried, like getting the seated from KKLT or something, and. Uh, um, but now they turn into a concrete proposals, so they, they can be subject to criticism themselves because now it's a very concrete proposal, the five dimensions. So, so if something doesn't work there, they have to explain it, and and I think it is good. So you can just people are debating about how trust how trustful trustful is their calculations, or uh, if the experimental result give you something negative, what happened to the proposal? What is it that you're ruling out? You're ruling out. Um, one particular calculation or one conjecture or the whole Swamland program or string theory or something. So you have to, the, at least then we have some, to answer some questions with with with, with the future, and, and I think that's very healthy for 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 science. I would say so. In the sense, uh, 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 that's the the positive twist I can give about that. Yeah, but I'm not very enthusiastic about the concrete. You know, this extra one dimension playing a key role. But I, I think see. So, uh, mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, now I want to ask you about uh, your time as the ICDP director. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you were uh, the director of ICDP for almost 10 years. So how was that experience? I mean, um, I mean, you're primarily a researcher, but uh, being in a in an administrative position for 10 years, did that significantly affect the time that you can give your research did that happen and apart from that were there some challenges that you faced in those 10 years that you didn't face before those 10 years and oh, how yes. was the overall experience yes overall i have to say is a probably the richest experience of my career i would say it's a, I, it was a real honor to be named the director of ICDP. i had been all a big admirer of salam since i was a student I had the privilege to meet him and talk to him and discuss with him and so, and um, and then occupying his position many years later, I think it was an incredible experience for me. As you say, I I I was I'm one of the typical scientists who doesn't like to do administration, so in that sense, I took it as a duty, <laughs> and the reason is because uh, you know I come from Guatemala, a developing country, and we hardly had opportunities to to develop scientifically because there's no no support for science in the country and uh, um, someone gave me the opportunity to go for my phd and then i i i, I managed to to succeed and get a get a position in in, in cambridge and then and so so um so i'm very thankful for people who helped me so in that sense uh, for me it was a uh, opportunity to pay back and try to provide opportunities or help to provide opportunities to, to students with similar conditions because we had an ICDP. Well, you know, that we, we had um, visitors from 188 countries, which is essentially almost the same level as the Olymp Olympic Games, which has 200. So essentially every single country in the world, people have been sending people to, to scientists to ICDP, which is already a big thing because it's, it's an advanced it's, it's an institute. It's a, you, know, you have to have a PhD and you have to 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 to, to or, or, or or be close, or be applying for a PhD to come to to ICTB. and and yet uh, it's very very global and and the mission is is for me is is a very inspiring and and so that gives you kind of extra meaning to your career and to your efforts. So and and I had a lot of. Uh, problems, of course, because uh, you know any institution with uh, two hundred employees, there are always issues and um, challenges about funding and and, and administration uh, issues and uh, and and so on. Um, but uh, at the end, you summarize things, and the uh, the, the the net result is far positive, and uh, and I think that's. Uh, uh, um, I would do it again many times <laughs> because this is a, it's so inspiring to be there and to see all the students, all the visitors that come with the different uh, uh, constraints, different problems uh, that uh, that uh, <clears throat> and then you were in a position to help and then, so you, you had a, the, you know, somehow this privilege had some power to support one. People who who were under very difficult conditions, 
and you don't see that in Europe or United States because yeah, you know people can do they like to do physics they do physics if not they can do something else and they, they will get support whereas for us coming from developing countries if you want to do physics you know you know that you're doing a big sacrifice because it's a big uh, uh, challenge to to succeed as as a, as a scientist in our countries, and uh, and so the motivation is, is stronger, the limitations are higher, and the, the challenges are bigger, and uh, and being in a position to to support scientists from from every single country in the world is 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 is, is wonderful. I, I, I'm very keen to that to that mission, and again, okay, so my admiration mm -hmm. for science increase, increase, increase over the years because you you got to know all the challenges that he faced. And all the things that he had achieved, which is so impressive. So my next question was actually about funding, and you also already mentioned it. So as in, not an outsider, but as a student in ICDP, I had this impression that ICDP is a very well-funded organization. But you said that there are there were challenges regarding funding. So were were there problems gathering funding for ICDP? Well, yes, you have to get the the budget approved every year. So it is, um, you know, ICDP is funded mostly by the Italian government, but it is also managed by UNESCO. So we, we were all UNESCO employees. So for that, we have to, to report to another part, which is already adds to the challenges. And uh, and actually the run is, I had as a director, I had to report to the steering committee. And the steering committee were three members, the, the IAEA, Atomic Energy, Energy Agency. Uh, oh, sorry, as you can see my... Um, the uh, Atomic Energy Agency, UNESCO, and the Italian government. And so and uh, so UNESCO was giving us administration, but was no funding. Italy was giving us uh, more than 80% of the funds. And IAEA was giving us some 10%. And, uh, and but also you have to, to report to them, and they all have their own priorities and their own interests of what STP should do to their, I mean, their, to their benefit also. So we had to, to to keep them all happy somehow, and um, and and work together with them to achieve what you want. So so it's it's, it's not easy. Uh, and uh, so well, we have had uh, many 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 issues that that happened that uh, that you know being a United Nations, um, you are also involved in many conflicts that that. that may happen in different countries and uh, so in, in that sense uh, you have to to to, to react as, as a united nations institution so um so it's, 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 uh, it's, it's for me it was uh, amazing just to 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 have that experience it opened up a lot of things because of course i am a scientist we do only high energy physics, but in ICTP, we do climate change, your renewable energies, and uh, condensed matter and mathematics, and so on. And I even opened a new group in in life sciences. And so, so it's the broadening of the of the of the research is, is far more. And then we did one one of my greatest satisfactions is something I never planned, which was we created this master program for for medical physics, and. Uh, and that's together with the IAEA. And so every year we had 20 students from 20 different countries and doing something that's for some of them, they were the only medical physicists in their own country. So when they were, they will, will go back, most of them will, will, go, will go back and, and uh, then they can make a huge difference saving lives and so on in their countries. So something that imagine us as theoretical physicists uh, having the opportunity to to give, have this impact in the society is, is is very fulfilling, and uh, and for me it's, it was it's a, it's a, it's a, a big success, and um, like for instance getting funding for that program was a challenge, or creating centers like the one in Brazil uh, and so on that we had now in China and Rwanda and, and Mexico is always a challenge to get uh, the approval and the support and so on. So. <clears throat> It was a unique experience. I really, uh, very, very pleased to have done it. Okay, so uh, now I, I have a specific question about uh, your your time at ICDP. So uh, I, I was in your you know farewell talk, and in that particular talk, you mentioned this thing that you had to cancel Elsevier subscription because that was costing about one percent of your total budget. So what I want to ask is that could you have retained some journals and not cancel all the subscription? No, no, that was it was all or nothing. Yes. Okay. Oh, in which talk did I mention that? I forgot. <laughs> oh yeah, you didn't mention that. I think that's one of the things that I remember from your talk. <laughs> that's the right. Yeah. 
Yes, I had to cancel it yet because, we, you know, we're a small institution. We didn't have enough budget to cover that. And thanks to that, we managed to hire two, at least two full-time scientists. So, so you 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 can judge what was what is better to have two full-time scientists who are educating people, organizing conferences, and doing proper research than paying for these journals. We checked with all the the the, the scientists, and only one actually really needed and he was ready to sacrifice so all the other ones they can live without the uh, elsevier and um yes and uh, i th- i think it was a good decision probably an institution like cambridge you cannot afford that because you know it's a huge mm-hmm. university so uh, but icdp were too small and we're we're not rich enough to 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 pay so much and then the and so the was industry. it a hard decision to take a bit, yes. I took hard, harder, harder, harder decisions than that. <laughs> okay. So I have a side question now, and it's more just like a hypothetical question. So you uh, you entered your tenure as a ICTP director in November 2019, and that was I think a couple of months before COVID came in. So if you were the director of ICTP in COVID, do you think that it would it would be a very hard year? Yes, yes. I was very lucky. Yes, yes. I just finished in, exactly as you say, I finished in November 2019. And, um, well, I think I count as my achievements in ICTB. One of them is to have left a good person as the next director. Mm-hmm. That That's something that's not trivial. So you have to, it took us like three years to get to the process to hire uh, that person. And I'm glad we we we, we had a, a attitude to to accept to do it and um, uh, but also yes I, I was feeling sad about him because he just started and immediately the whole STP changed you know you, you have this big hotel with uh, you know, seven stories hotel uh, and it's totally empty no there were no visitors the students had to be confined in, in some small places there and uh, so the, the activity of STP which is bringing you know 6,000 visitors per year and plus the students and so on well, the 60 conferences a year and so that they were all cancelled so it was very very difficult and i think i think that also well there's always a positive part so they managed to adapt to use zoom and this kind of thing so now that they, they can have a hybrid kind of conferences or activities which is good but i think uh, i didn't envy uh, Atish for the the, the the couple of years that they, they had which was when they were very difficult i would say and then luckily now it's Things are going back to normal, but uh, yes, uh, it was. In yeah, sense I mean, of... I, I, I mean, I was in ICTP. Uh, I was in ICTP when it was COVID, and I, th- I think that they handled it really well. I mean, they also increased stipends of students because they thought that they may need mm-hmm. the money, and they also gave us, uh, you know, um, access to mental mental health counseling if we needed that. I think I think it was a uh, it, it was very well 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 held. Yes. Uh, so, do you want to say something else uh, in that question or? Oh, no, 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 I forgot. I was, I was just going to add something simple. Okay. Simple. okay, so when I announced this podcast, some people asked me some questions to ask you. So I now I have some of the questions from the people. So I'm just going to, you know, uh, uh, you know, tell you the question. And if you want to answer that question, let me know. So the question is that, uh, what alternatives to the Brenderberger Waffa mechanism do we have to explain why the number of large dimensions is three? large space dimensions i wish we had one yes uh, i would love to have it um no for instance i was excited about this salam Sengin story that i said well it's nice that it, it, it it's it's naturally give you a um, solution which in what four dimensions and not in six which is is what, what you would like to happen eh? the fundamental theory doesn't give you solutions at the number of dimensions but you are you were forced to compactify i always remember there was a probably you have heard about the famous talk that the Whitting gave in 1995 uh, uh, when the second string revolution came. And it was this one of those memorable talks that uh, and he started saying, uh, I wanted to prove why we live in four dimensions, but I failed. And then after that, he gave the most wonderful talk you have ever heard. <laughs> and then he came up with M theory and all those things. Uh, so I think it's, all, it's in the back of many people's mind to 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 try to explain that. And, and uh, at the moment, uh, we don't have anything. So we did a bit, uh, you know, we had this paper in 2000, I don't know, 2000, 2000 and uh, it's called Brain and Brain Inflation. And, uh, so there was a, 
the previous paper of um, Valley and Tai, they were talking about brain inflation. You have two brains. They are BPS, so they they do not attract each other. And uh, but then they said maybe there's at some point you break that that condition is very small, and then you may have some. But 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 we did. It was just instead of having two brains, you have a brain and anti brain, and then they attract each other because like the Coulomb interaction, and that attraction we were using that to get uh, the potential for that uh, Coulomb potential will give you the, the the a good inflationary potential, and I think the idea was very nice because uh, you have a constant term coming from the tensions of the brains. Plus the 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 decaying part coming from the Coulomb interaction, and that looks like an inflationary potential. Uh, unfortunately, of course, we were at that time it was before this KKLT, so before we, we didn't know how to fix the moduli. So we had, and and the simplest solution was that we needed for inflation to work, we needed the separation of the brains to be bigger than the size of the extra dimensions, which uh, uh, didn't work. So some so point you had to do some 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 game, but the scenario was interesting as a scenario itself. Even the, the end of inflation, because at some point the two brains get, the brain and the brain get close to each other, and then at some point there is this open stream that is stretching between one and the other one. It becomes lighter and lighter when they get closer, and at some point becomes massless, and after that it becomes tachyonic. Being tachyonic gives you a, a direction where you can finish inflation. So it was a beautiful uh, representation of, of uh, what people call hybrid inflation. And and very stringy, you know, the, the tachyon is a real string field, and the separation of the brains is a string. So, and when when we wrote that paper, we also said, well, for this uh, brains to 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 attract each other and collide, you need um, imagine you have a gas of brains um, in ten dimensions, and so we said that they are going to go to meet uh, and, and 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 I then give you inflation, and. Uh, so we said, well, they have to have at least four dimensions <clears throat> in 10, because 4 plus 4 is 8, plus the, the time dimension. That will give you 10. So, and But you start from type 2B, string, string theory, which is, which is the one that was giving us the, the, the inflation. You only can have a, a odd number of, of dimensionality. So so the, so the critical dimension is 4, but you actually, the first case you have is 3. So only three brains can meet can 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 be around to to meet each other, and uh, and three brains, and then you can have uh, the other the other dimension will be one, you know, three, one, and minus one. So one will be is cosmic strings, which is we can see. Is uh, uh, two will be domain walls, which will be very bad, and we don't have them because it's only uh, 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 odd dimensions. And zero will be monopoles that we also will be dangerous, and we don't have them. So it was a nice picture that you have. Three brains, cosmic strings, and then minus one brains, which are instantons, that also can play a role. So in that sense, everything fitted very, very nicely. And the, there was this critical dimensionality that is uh, the the the, the these three brains satisfy. So we combine that with the uh, with this Berger Waffe idea with the strings uh, talking to each other. Uh, so we can so the Berger Waffe select three dimensions in one direction, and we, uh, in one way, and we select the three dimensions for, for another different reasons. So we were very excited at that time, but uh, nothing came out beyond that, uh, just a uh, wording. Um, there was some follow-up paper. I think there was a paper of Lisa Randall by herself uh, two or three years later, where she reanalyzed more concrete calculations. And then she found that, that you can find D3 brains and also D7 brains. For some reason, D7 brains would work. And uh, I forgot the, the, her argument. And um, and the, those those I like because precisely when you look for the standard model in string theory, the standard model is either in D seven brains or in D three brains. So so in the sense it, it was a nice picture, but uh, but I don't think anything any, anything more than that just just uh, this uh, small attempts to 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 get a better explanation. But, um, so of course the other explanation is anthropic, but yeah. <laughs> we don't like that. Yeah, you know, having a, a, a stable orbits and planets and all those things, and that's uh, that single out our dimension. Okay, so then so the next question from the people is that can you ask him when he plans to archive his standard model notes? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, I think they're going to be. A, uh, I promised my my former student and collaborator Andreas Schachner that we will finish before I leave Cambridge, which will be 10 days from today. So I hope we will do that. Are you leaving Cambridge? Yes. 
Oh, okay. I didn't it's, know that. I, I'm I'm retired. So I retired okay. last year. So now I'm spending oh. only the summers at uh, Cambridge. Yes. I see. I see. Okay, so the next question is that the criticism of string theory uh, is uh, many a times uninformed and it is uh, increased a lot re in recent years and it is re reaching public media. This criticism can affect the funding situation in the field. How should we address this problem? Yes, I, th I think it's, 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 um, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a concern. Um, I can give you an example that, that is very explicit. You know, I live in the UK, and I try to be as open-minded as possible in many things, and I, I read all the different uh, serious uh, uh, media I mean, uh, journals. And um, so one of them I read is essentially almost every week is uh, The Economist. So The Economist is, for me, is a wonderful source of information, very professional. Whatever they say, they think very deeply about it, and it's... They have a very strong opinion. So, and so, and I, I always admire the way that they, you know, they, you read their article in a way that you start thinking that they go in this direction, so that they turn around and go in another direction. At the end, you get a bigger picture. And, uh, but then they wrote an article like a couple of years ago, and it appeared even in, in the kind of they put the, the highlights in the first page, two, three or four, and then they say something about the string theory is gone. Something like that, and uh, and the reason they say that is because uh, um, since they didn't find supersymmetry in the in LHC, so the, the string theory was predicting supersymmetry, and, so, and therefore the string theory is ruled out. And I, I I reacted immediately and sent them a letter. So I said you uh, you cannot you cannot criticize string theory. In, in both directions. So one criticism is that you not, don't make predictions, and the other criticism is that that you predicted something that was rolled out. So it's, it's one or the other one. And uh, and uh, and and of course, string theory likes supersymmetry, but doesn't tell you at which scale supersymmetry is broken. So everything about the string theory that we have been saying for the last 30, 30 years or so, it remains the same, no changes uh, after LSE not the score of supersymmetry. Of course, if they will have discovery, it would have been nice because it will fit with the, in the picture of string theory. But if they don't discover it, there's no, nothing because it can be at you know string uh, supersymmetry can be broken at the TV scale, but it can be ten TV, hundred TV, thousand TV, all the way to ninety to nineteen GV. So in that sense, there is no uh, no scales for only supersymmetry is broken. So and uh, and the reason to expect supersymmetry on the TV was was the hierarchy problem. There is a problem there uh, in that low energy, but it's not related to string. It's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a condition for a string theory. Uh, so I, th I thought about that, and, and I was very disappointed because uh, at the end, they ch we exchanged emails with, us, with them. Then the, the person who, the editor sent me to the person who wrote the paper, and then he apologized and so on. But they didn't put it in the journal, so they didn't put it that there was something wrong that, that I claimed exactly what they and just usually they had a section where they put the letters, but this one they didn't. So I was very disappointed because it's a journal that I I, I really admire a lot, and they failed me. And, and so whenever I have a chance to say it, I will say it because uh, the, the, in the sense they were on they were not honest because they were claiming something that was wrong, and and it, it remains there and it's still there. Uh, you go search for string theory in the economist you will find that article and you will say oh if people who read and I, I, I trust them in some other um things they say i was reading some articles about biology i'm not a biologist but i said well maybe i learned some biology but you know they had a nice series of articles on biology and then i said well should i trust them or not because if, if they're saying wrong things for string theory they, they will be saying also for other things so in that sense i was disappointed and i, and I agree with this thing but you have to 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 see this in a, in a bigger context. Um, in the, you know, for the first string revolution, essentially we profited a lot. Uh, you know, people were so excited about string theory. All the jobs were going to to string theorists, and uh, then there were reactions. Uh, after a while, uh, in particular, there was this famous book of uh, Liz Molling. And then it's like, okay, there are other approaches to to quantum gravity. Is only all the jobs go to string theorists. And uh, and in that sense, there's some truth in that. Of course, the it goes to because there's it's the most promising approach and something. But but you can see. Um, then there was this uh, Brian Green text uh, popular science book 
that uh, made it very popular. People, you know, the students in, in high school and so on were reading about the elegant universe and so on. So they wanted to dream to be strange in theory. So we, we profited in that sense that we got a lot of good good uh, students to, to do string theory. And uh, I think uh, we cannot... I think there's a little bit of responsibility that probably we're over-optimistic in, in the, at the early days. And uh, and um, now there's a... There's reactions to be over pessimistic <laughs> that the people are too pessimistic on this. Oh, now you you have been working on this for thirty years and then nothing. Uh, um, I, I disagree. Totally disagree with that. That the, you know, the progress has been made in uh, slowly, but there's always progress, and and it's still the, the you want to address the most important question in physics. This is the most important question in physics, and this is the the, the only candidate for real uh, unification of all the interactions. So, so other approaches to quantum gravity concentrate on gravity. This one you concentrate on all gravity and all the other interactions and all the particles, and that's that's the the, the, the deepest uh, thing you have to address. And so in that sense, the motivation is still the same. The questions are still the same. So in that sense, it's, it's a good motivation for students to enter because the the, the most important results are still yet to be found. Uh, and and it is active in the sense that there is always progress. And funding is always complicated. And um, and uh, yes, I agree that sometimes uh, we we so I, I experienced it here from in Cambridge with the we had this part three program for masters, and a few years ago the uh, one student was going going to give a talk to other students and he was apologizing because he was doing a string theory like say oh you still <laughs> believe in strings and that that I think is totally wrong I mean this is the most exciting subject and uh, uh, yes and 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 there I mean. Uh, uh, it has been expanding in directions that we didn't foresee, and there are results like the um, holography, which are uh, outstanding approaches to to black hole information and uh, not to cosmology and so on. So in that sense, uh, we have to be probably more humble and patient to 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 wait because it's uh, again it's, it's the most ambitious theory, so you you need you know you need to have. The most uh, str the strongest possible results, and uh, things I think they turn out to be more difficult than people expected at the beginning, but that doesn't mean that uh, that, that uh, nothing is happening. Like there's always something happening and progress is being made. Okay, so the next question is that: What is his advice about students who are just starting their undergraduate in physics? Well, um, to learn as much as possible from other subjects. Here in Cambridge, we have a nice program that the people, when they enter physics, they do natural sciences. They do physics, chemistry, and biology at the same time. And that gives them some uh, a broad perspective of things. Um, I, I'm very big fan of biology and, uh, and, and the quantitative active parts of biology that are coming from kind of physics kind of thinking. So in that sense, I think it's, it's, it's good that they have that. On the other hand, here we are, in the, I'm in the math department, so we take the students come th through the pure mathematics uh, background, and some of them don't care about the uh, Theoretical physics, and they just want to prove a theorem or number theory or something that they see physics as a very uh, kind of a not too exciting thing. So um, I, I think that's good because I mean, there are many good mathematicians that have been uh, uh, coming and doing that. But what I will say is to, it always helps to be as broad as possible and to, to get to know uh, a bit because we don't know where things are moving. There's now this big uh, developments in machine learning and this kind of things that I think it will be important as tools. Probably would not be as, as important as people claim to be you know, replacing scientists or so, but at least as a, as a main tool is is, is, is is going to play a role. So I think it's good to to get training as much as possible or everything related with computer sciences. And... Um, and uh, yes, we don't know where things are moving, so it's better to have the tools. And also we know that um, uh, one advantage that we have uh, over uh, social sciences and so is that 
you you want to study physics, you want to be a physicist. Uh, but the job market is very limited. And but by being trained or being a physicist, you can adapt to many other things. And 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 uh, in particular, these computers, uh, computation uh, tools are very important because then you can work. Well, obvious places to work in a bank, or to, or, but also now there's a lot of uh, room for uh, physicists working in biology. That's that's becoming more and more fashionable and more and more useful. So people are taking seriously the the, the way of thinking of physicists to approach questions in biology, and and that then the market there is much bigger. And so so in that sense, uh, you have the the good tools. You may adapt to, to whatever uh, is, 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 is more appealing to get the uh, jobs in the future and, this, uh, and have your own, all your, your options open. I mean, getting all the way to be a faculty in Harvard or something is a good possibility, but you can also do biology in some other place or, or, or <clears throat> computer science. Or now there's this uh, um, um, quantum information that is also attracting a lot of. Uh, a, a, a lot of the people uh, with training in fundamental physics, so which I think is, is also welcome because uh, now the job market is not only in the academia, but also in the industry. So the institutions like Google and so on, they are hiring people to do research, not only to, to do their uh, systems, computer, uh, uh, um, what's called? Um, um, Systems engineer, but it can be people doing proper research in quantum information also, which I, I find that very positive because then academia may not be the only way. But um, okay, so the quest next question is that when you were a student, what was the most favorite course that you took? Oh, quantum mm -hmm. mechanics. Yes. Okay. Who taught that course? Um, well, I'm sure you know, oh, in, in, I was undergrad student. This is one of my, my professors in Guatemala. Is a okay. Cajas, yes. Um, yes. Uh, you know, quantum mechanics, I always find it extremely like, crazy. And uh, and the fact that it's true is amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's one of the things that makes you physics to be, to be very, very appealing. It's not just standard classical mechanics. Uh, calculations, but you you're doing something which is totally um, shaking your your head, and then I think that's yes, quantum mechanics has to be the the most okay. exciting. So the next question is that what's the most feared book that he ever read? Is it Jackson Electrodynamics or something else? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> we all suffer with Jackson. We had to take two courses in in, in uh, one of these big seven courses we take in, in Texas. Two of them were Jackson and Shadowdynamics, and the questions were so difficult. So the the, the, the subject you said, oh, you can learn a little bit of mathematical physics, and and then you learn a lot of things about uh, yes, Legendre polynomials and, and uh, uh, many things. Um, but the questions, the questions were so difficult, and we had to compete. We had to to solve them all, uh, and, and then because the exams were based on some of those questions. And to get a good mark, you have to 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 do everything, and it was so difficult. And, um, we had a rule in in Austin because um, uh, very few, uh, in particular, someone like Cliff, he he was so high that when he came, that he didn't have to take all those courses, so he just immediately went to do to only the, the 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 specific courses in, in high energy and then research. And uh, we were all very envious because we had to suffer all nights were working with quantum uh, with the electromagnetism questions. And so, but then we had a seminar every uh, Friday that is only among students and postdocs. So a uh, con condition to be able to give a seminar like that is to solve one Jackson problem. So, so that means that you know, at least uh, someone like Cliff had to actually go and suffer <laughs> and then give the seminar whatever research he was doing. And uh, the other... The other uh, um, Anecdote I have is that one of my closest friends, he finished his second course on Jackson and he came to my office. So oh, that's it. I will never open that book again. So that's, I uh, suffered all this year with all so many things. I, I will never open the book. Two weeks later, he comes to my office and says, Can I borrow your uh, Jackson? Because I promise not to open <laughs> 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 So, so that, 
Yeah. Okay, so the next question is that what are the qualifications that you look for when you are taking master's or PhD students? Uh, and what about someone from a US background, which is different from UK background? Yes, well, for me, well, my first thing is motivation. Uh, you know, this is a, the, the students have to be very motivated because that, that's, that what makes a difference if they really want to actually. It takes a lot of effort from them, so you have to see if they are motivated. And then, of course, you have to see that if they have performed well enough. They don't have to be the, the very best student in the university or something, but it's someone who is motivated and doing exactly this because, you, you know, there's... The things vary with you, how good a student you are compared to how good a researcher you are is different. So, and um, yes, the background in um, in Europe and the United States is very different. Eh? The, in Europe is very high. And that's why we had this diploma course in, in, in Trieste. Uh, for instance, I would not be able, I would not have been able to go directly from Guatemala to CISA, for instance, to, in Italy, because I, uh, my background was, was, was not good enough because they started already to field theory and creativity and so on. Whereas I was able to go to the United States and take all these courses, uh, electron dynamics and so on. So, uh, and so, uh, so, so yes, so, uh, um, but, I, yes, but I, I think you come to Cambridge, one thing that I will do, uh, I have had some students like that, that they come directly to, to the PhD and I ask them to take some courses to part three. Just to, to to level their whatever uh, gap they may have, and then start doing research. But it's it's important to have, a, you know, basic courses on field theory, basic courses on GR, even uh, yes, as I say, even cosmology. So <clears throat> the standard model is. I think it's always say I always say the standard model uh, has to be. Well, you know, it's, it's very nice, but it's true. <laughs> it's also true. So in that sense, uh, it's a course that I think. Everybody should take essentially because this is where that's, that's the, the best understanding of nature we have so far. And, and and everything has been tested. And we know, you know, there are not only nice ideas on uh, interest in formalism, but it's a uh, big experimental confirmation. So that's uh, uh, it's, it's something that should be typical background of everybody. But after that, then yeah, I think you, you can do it. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the next question, I think this is, this is the second last question. So the next question is that, do you think that the cosmology is taken over by particle physicists and quantum cosmologists, or do you think that the GR-based approaches are still relevant to do cosmology? Well, yes, um, there are two types of, I mean, seven types of cosmology, but I, I, I think... Um, now we are in a critical moment about the high energy physics because the phenomenological part, if energy hasn't found anything after the Higgs and it looks that it may, may not happen for a few years. So people with phenomenological mind have to think about what else to do. And what else to do is essentially everything with astroparticle physics. And you come with a phenomenological mind. And um, actually, I had this experience. I was in the whole last year on sabbatical at CERN. Well, sabbatical after my retirement, I went to CERN for a whole year. And there's a nice, very, very nice group doing, uh, we just begin the standard modeling cosmology. And uh, I can see that this this is, and there are plenty of things happening there with a uh, close to experiment. They have to be able to analyze experiments. They, they move from dark matter to neutrino physics to gravitational waves and so on. So it's, it's, it's very. Uh, interesting and active field whenever you're thinking as, as a phenomenologist, you know, always every, thinking about uh, anything that to do with the experiment. And uh, I really enjoy very much learning from my very young colleagues there do, doing it that way because I'm, I'm a bit more formal than, than, than them. And I, and I think that's, that's probably the most promising area I can see at the moment because uh, experiments are, are being done now and there are experiments being planned there for the next uh, 10, 20 years or so. So in that sense, there's something will happen, will be happening like the uh, DESI or Euclid or um, then SKA and, and um, then more uh, LISA and so on. Um, <clears throat> so, so I think that that, that, that is very promising. Uh, but then there's still the deeper questions. I mean, the, the, you know, what the question said about quantum cosmology. And that I think there's also something to be understood. Um, 
And um, so, for instance, people like uh, Valdacena now, who's uh, leading as a string theorist, essentially, but he's thinking in that direction. There's a, and these things come, you know, the Wheeler, the Wheeler question, the Hartle Hawking um, uh, states and, 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 and the scenario. And uh, they have been, from a particle physics, physicist perspective, you know, some people say, well, we look long. That that, that that they don't look very solid because uh, this is always a strong assumption. There's something called mini superspace, where the super, superspace is huge and mini superspace is just big simplifications. So it's not a real, well defined approximation where you can trust. So it's uh, so sometimes you feel that it's not uh, well defined um, uh, questions that you can do calculations to to, to trust contrary to, to effective theory. On the other hand. Um, well, uh, 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 precisely because of that, there's, there's a good challenge because then, then there are things they need to be better understood. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, also, I take the example, like, um, you know, with the black hole information paradox, the people have been working on that for almost 50 years from Hawkins paper. And uh, it's still is an open question. But people have been making progress using holography and so on. Um, and then the most recent progress is just to describe this uh, page curve in, in quantum information that the entropy increases and then they can decrease. And the surprising thing is that they managed to get all that using basically these semi-classical techniques. It's not, not string theory, nothing sophisticated, just uh, uh, putting together ideas on, on holography but uh, uh, to motivate, but then they, they did. They look for saddle points, and they have an extra saddle point that allows them to, to solve that. And uh, that's a good lesson that they said that probably this classic, uh, semi-classical methods are not that bad, so they can they, they, they may be trustable. And then, um, personally, I've been working in a question for the last few years about the vacuum transitions. Um, you know, if thinking about the landscape of string theory, you have many, many solutions, so you can go from one minimum to another minimum, like a tunneling effect. And... Uh, the pioneer work on that was from Coleman and Deruccia in 1980. And uh, and you can think about vacuum transitions without gravity. People have done that, and you can create this uh, nuclear bubble, and then but there are more bubbles, and then you can just, each bubble will be like a universe, and that's how this picture of the, of the multiverse comes up. Uh, but with gravity, it's much less understood. And there are things that happen which are non standard. For instance, uh, you have a potential with two minima. You can tunnel from the higher minimum to another lower minimum. Both both the sitters are both positive cosmic constants. So you can turn it from one desitter to another desitter. Uh, but if you have gravity, you can also turn back, a tunnel back. You can go from the lower one to the other one. So there's a probability different from zero to, to do that. So you and the difference between two is like give you by detail balance and so it's a nice it's a nice picture. But there are also questions that, that uh, for instance, when you tunnel. Uh, everything is done in approximation just because you click on quantum gravity, which is not very well justified. And but you assuming all that, then Coleman and the Richard they claim that the, the bubble that is formed from the one vacuum in, in, the, in the background of the other vacuum, so this bubble that will start expanding from, from this uh, different vacuum inside and outside the bubble, um, that bubble, our universe would be one of those bubbles. And that bubble, in, if, if their approach is correct, the universe has to be open. It cannot be closed or flat. It has to be open. And so looking for general predictions of string theory, this will be as close as you get from it. Because then you have this say, infinite number of bubbles, but all those universes that have something in common, they will be flat, they will be open. And then you can test experimentally if our universe is open or not. So there have been some claims in the last few years that you can, it's closer to be closed than open and this kind of things. But you can measure the, the special curvature of the universe. And, it's, and um, I have been questioning that conclusion. So in, in my own research with other colleagues, we are questioning if you can actually uh, get a close universe or not. Um, and, but those are open questions, and these are interesting, very interesting and, and, and important questions. And again, they suffer from the same criticism that you would have said about the Hawking radiation, uh, Hawking information loss. Uh, but if, 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 if in black holes the semi-classical calculations were good enough to, to make progress, maybe in understanding quantum vacuum transitions between different vacua may, may also be uh, 
possible. I mean, using those techniques, or, or, or we can get a bit better understanding. So, and I, I consider that as another, you know, these are like um, um, uh, theoretical experiments. So the velocity of information from the black hole, that's an idea coming from Hawking. There's no experiment there, and yet you have the deepest minds in the last 50 years trying to solve that problem. And uh, and and that's good because it's, it's it, why is that because it's an it's an it's an example where you have uh, gravity is playing a role in black holes and quantum effects are playing a role the Hawking radiation and uh, and that's where you expect a theory of quantum gravity to tell you something and and since Hawking pointed out the paradox of the loss of information so there was a real concrete question you can approach so in that sense it's a good theoretical laboratory to 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 explore issues of quantum and gravity. And I'm claiming now that this vacuum transition from one to another is another case where you can have the transitions. If the transition is a tunnel effect, it's quantum, and then you need gravity for the bubbles to 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 to, to, to be materialized and so on. And uh, uh, and then it's another theoretical laboratory for understanding the quantum gravity. So exploring those questions or concrete questions where you have some things to address, either is the universe open or closed or so, or can you go from the city point to the city or can you go back or this kind of things. Uh, uh, it, it is a good, I would say, theoretical laboratory to address concrete questions and then I eventually learn more about quantum gravity. So in that direction, I think this is the, what people, the, the person who made the question about quantum cosmology could be said in that, that these directions are, are, are I can see I consider them still promising and the questions are very deep so yes. okay okay so the last question from the people is that so you gave these lectures in Cambridge I think in 2006 on supersymmetry so the question is that your supersymmetry lectures are good will you write a book on supersymmetry uh, you know it's, it's um, I have been asked to do it uh, for several years, from I've been talking to, with Cambridge University Press, and I was I said, well, at some point I will do it. Maybe I can have some more time, and so. Um, but now I hesitate because you know, supersymmetry is not the best time for supersymmetry. Is particularly in my approach, which was I was emphasizing a bit the, the phenomenological aspects of supersymmetry. And and there are other books already in the in the market, so I, I have to think. What is it that I could add that is not there that I can justify it to, to, to make it into a book? And um, I even thought about combining it with my standard model lectures and make it something mm -hmm. bigger. Um, but uh, yes, I'm still thinking about it, but it's not, a, uh, I don't know if, if it is the right time to do it. Uh, if they would have discovered over symmetry, it would have been great. Or if, or if it had been many years ago, where people were waiting, <laughs> hoping that supercentral was going to be discovered. Um, now it's, it's, it's probably not the not the best time to come up with the, or of course, super, the motivation for supersymmetry is always there because of, as a formal theory, as you say, the calculations you can trust. And, you know, and, and I think in my lecture, there are some things that, that are not, I, I don't see other um, treatments about, for instance, uh, well, I see, I, I have to, uh, I don't see it in everything, in any other treatments except for Weinberg. I feel Weinberg, uh, Weinberg doesn't let anything not go. <laughs> so, so essentially, but essentially, for instance, proving why eleven dimensions or ten dimensions are, uh, are the maximum, uh, or n equals to a supersymmetry the maximum, it is not very often uh, proven in in in, in, in some uh, treatments in lecture notes or books. That I think, uh, for me, is one of the important parts of of my lectures to do that. So, so uh, yeah, I don't know. I I I, I may do it, and uh, yes, I'm very pleased that I've met many people who tell me, "Oh, I have learned supersymmetry from your videos." Uh, yeah, same, me too. Uh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So, I think I think I think I told you that thing after your farewell talk in ICDP that I liked your supersymmetry lectures. Oh, good, good, uh, good. Thank, you. thank you. Yes. So yes, and there's people who are, uh, you know. Uh, leaders in the field now. Um, I got surprised uh, a few years ago with this guy, Simon's uh, Duffins, Simon's Duffins, who is one mm. of the leaders. Yeah. And uh, I, I went to ask him for some reference and he said, oh, I learned supersymmetry from your notes as well. <laughs> so it's amazing that, that so apparently it has been useful, the videos. And I have to thank 
my former student, Shehu Abdul Salam, who did the filming, he came in with it. And, but also people here in Cambridge who uh, were doing the mostly about the uh, filming, uh, where we discuss about because I we I'm very convinced that uh, things like part three should be available to many people if you film the lectures to, to, so that many people can profit without necessarily coming to Cambridge. But it's I mean something I may try at some point. I'm sure you know about uh, Matteo Bertolini from CISA. Yes, yes. I yes, think he, his lectures are probably the best lectures on supersymmetry in written form, not in recorded form, in written form. Oh, is that right? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So, and, and he keeps updating them. So I think right now they are, uh, I think, uh, uh, a book length long, I think probably 350 pages. Yeah, that's a long, uh, long lecture notes. Yeah. So I think yeah. he should definitely convert that to a book. <laughs> but I think you, you can he also can. do it. Yeah, that's true. Yes, I, I would be surprised. Does he do phenomenology? Uh some phenomenology at the end, but um, they are not, you know, geared towards phenomenology. I think he yeah, does exactly. something like uh, he he does cyber wit and duality and things like that. But yes, they are not exactly. phenomenology. Exactly. So that I can imagine is more appealing for a book now because it's mm -hmm. formal things, uh, solid uh, knowledge of, of, of supersymmetry with applications mostly theoretical, not experimental. Whereas I have to confess, mine were more towards. Uh, the motivation for this, uh, the supersymmetric standard model and, 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 and the hierarchy problem is more, more phenomenological. And I, I can see less motivation at the moment because we don't know what's going to happen. Whereas for the formal aspects, I think uh, Matteo, uh, Matteo is a great guy, so I'm sure the lectures are very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, so uh, I, I have a, a follow-up question on that. So uh, I'm sure you know about this book on supersymmetry. I cannot recall the exact names of the authors, but they are more like Muller, Kirsten, and Weidman. Uh, it's published by World Scientific. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The right. one who do the calculations. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so they do all the calculations and they do all the steps. So if you write a book, will it be like that? <laughs> or it will be something different from that? Because if no. I remember correctly, I think in your lectures, you say that you don't recommend this book. Yeah. You hesitate to recommend this right. book. Oh, because we found uh, at that time, no, but there's, an, uh, there's a new edition. I did that uh, 20, 10 years or so. I didn't, I don't know. Uh, I, I remember there were some typos, I guess, uh, that uh -huh, I okay. confused myself at the time. Probably they corrected them. And uh, on the other hand, it's good to be technical, but uh, important things also to track the, the, the physics. And uh, you can you cannot do both simultaneously because I mean you know there's no time but uh, but on the other hand a book like that is useful if you want to 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 be sure that the calculations you're doing are, 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 are trustable also because they give you all the steps so yes probably I I was not fair to them if I didn't recommend it <laughs> Right. I mean, and the thing is that uh, I will understand why why you would say that because uh, for a student who is learning supersymmetry for the first time, uh, that book can give you the habit of not doing steps, which is not a good habit, right? Um, yes, and I think that, that that particular book is probably the the opposite of Weizenberger because Weizenberger, you know, <laughs> asks you to derive everything, right? <laughs> yes, amazing. Well, and the Weizenberger is the, was the only book available when I was a student. It was very very. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but now okay, there are so, several books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I was thinking that there's a, I haven't looked at them, but there was a book by Pierre Binetui many, 10 years ago. There was a book by Herbie Dreiner on, on Supersymmetry. So, yeah, but I haven't seen them to see. No, I don't know about that book. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so my questions are over. So uh, I think, uh, I, you know, we, we can wrap it up now. So thank you so much for your time. No, it thank was you. such thank a you. nice, it was a pleasure to talk to you. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And the YouTube algorithm thinks that you will also like this video.